Laodicea. The place called Laodicea, uh, there are workers that were used there. Now, uh, Brother Branham was quoting from, he, 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 he did not just directly start from him, he learned from others too. The prophet uh, is restoring the heart of the fathers to the children, which is being Berean, to the truth. Berean means you wish to emphasize on the truth. You want to prove it. You do not want to misjudge it. So you look at the evidence without bias. You're objective. So what happens is, <coughs> as he introduced the spirit back, he also is studying other messengers that were previous to him, Clarence Martin. <coughs> Many other, you know the understanding of the church ages did not start with uh, Brother Branham. It started with, in the Philadelphian church age. Those who studied in Bible school, maybe you're aware of that, right? They already knew about the church ages. The verse I quoted, Revelation 1.19, the things which shall be hereafter, these portray what will happen to the church. What will happen to the church as from the time of Christ until the end. Remember, starting from the time of Christ, it is called the last days in Acts chapter 2. The last days seems to be 2,000 years. <laughs> Where is, the day, where is the promise of His coming? Why does it take 2,000 years? Well, for every believer who has heard the gospel, it's the last days. Because it's not necessarily the end of the world, but the end of your life and a, de a decision for your life. Those in the Old Testament had their decision and they were fetched by Christ, those who were redeemed. But how about the New Testament? You have your own decision. This is the last days. The last days was shown as the church ages. Because for the last 2,000 years, for the last 2,000 years, there were, what happened to the church? There's a falling away. It's not a mystery why there are many denominations today. So the falling away of the church <coughs> is the love letter of Jesus Christ to the church. What will happen to Eve, the, spirit, the, the symbolical Eve? today, which is the church. As the first Eve fell away, the same goes with the church today. There is called the great harlot. What kind of original sin did Eve do? She is called, the, the church is called the great whore. With her harlot daughters. Even the denominations that came out of the church are harlot daughters. What makes you a harlot? What makes you a harlot is the same spirit that crucified Christ on the cross, the Nicolaitan spirit, the spirit of closing the minds of people. Uh, 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 Pastor Art mentioned about loyalty to a church. That's Nicolaitan spirit. I'm talking of a local organized church or a denomination. Our loyalty is in the Word of God. Our loyalty is not in any organization. And uh, if that organization tries to force people, to prevent people from proving out the truth, from deep, up, digging up the deep things of God as He has promised for the church, the true church, then it is against the will of God. That they are playing the role of the Antichrist. They are speaking about Christ, but they are playing against the role of Antichrist. The role of Antichrist. Now let's go back to the church ages. In every age, like Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, there's the local church, what Pastor mentioned as Antipas. He was slain in that local church. But that local church showed something in the universal church. The universal church is, uh, let us say, the whole Christendom. What happened to the whole Christendom? I'll give you an example. Ephesus church age, as the prophet said. There's a mistake in what they say it started in 50 grade AD. No. 50 grade AD, as what the prophet said, is what started the local church in Ephesus. But the church age of Ephesus started at Pentecost, 30 grade AD. They burned the books in the local church of Ephesus, but there was a fire of the Holy Ghost that came down. That came down at Pentecost. 
So it's not 33 AD local church, Ephesus also at the same time, 53 AD church. It's wrong, that's wrong. There's a mistake in how they understood the message. It's 33 AD. It shows the universal church, although it started there in the upper room, at the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, it spread out in the whole Roman Empire. The first church age was portended, was portrayed by the local church of Ephesus. They were on fire with the Lord. And the fire spread out from Ephesus to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, then Philadelphia, Laodicea. And do you understand the menorah? Who, under, who among you knows the menorah of the Jews? It's a seven-armed candlestick. Uh, we don't have the board, but maybe you can imagine that. Is there a menorah there? Oh, there's a picture of that. Okay, the shoot that part. So, so, the menorah, the seven-armed candlestick, how was it lit? God did not just give the ceremonies of the Jews for nothing. He was showing us something. The ceremonies that were given to the Jews were to show one of them is the church ages. What happened to the church? And that's how you're going to find yourself. Where do you find yourself identifying yourself with Christ in the end times? Do you know what happened to the church? How will you identify yourself with the church? Some have insisted in organizational church. Join the true church. Ours is the true church. How do you identify yourself back to the true church? You need to understand what happened to the church. What happened to its teachings? The falling away and the restoration. This is what you need to find. And you're gonna, only going to achieve that through having this Berean repentance. I connect Berean repentance to the repentance of Acts 2.38. Repentance. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Before you go baptizing, getting yourself baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you need to repent the right way. It's not just repentance from vices. So from cigarettes, from liquors, you repent yourself from ignorance. You repent yourself from hard-heartedness towards God. You may be a priest in the temple of God, but you may be close-minded to the progressive revelation that God has been fulfilling since the days of Christ, even to, until today. You need to open up your spirit. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter says, The day you hear his voice, harden up your hearts. That's how you open up. That's how you have very repentance. And if you have this kind of repentance, then you need to know how the church fell away and how the church got restored. And this is the love letter Christ wrote to the church. You know, there were many epistles, and there were many claimants to the Apocryphal book, that they were also genuine. But you know what? Christ sealed the Bible with the book of Revelation. So those that were written beforehand are preserved. <coughs> those that came after could not falsify what was written beforehand. They could not duplicate the epistles of the Apostles. And we have the Bible today as a safety, as a, a, uh, a urine to make, as a guard to check what is right and what is wrong. What was the original teaching us of the apostles? Then you can follow up where it, was, where it fell away and where it will be restored back. The love letter of Jesus Christ to the church shows the age. Let me show you another age, the Smyrna church age. You read the local church there had the persecution. But in the literal, in, in the universal church, there were, not just in Smyrna, in the whole Roman Empire, there was a wave of persecution. That fit in the age. Let's go to the third age. The citadel of Satan. The Pergamean church age. Where Nicolaitanism became a doctrine. Well, if Nicolaitanism became a doctrine, then it's the age where the Catholic Church was conceived, was accepted. The age where uh, Constantine convened the bishops to vote whether Arius or Athanasius' Godhead is correct. 
That's the age where the Pergamian age where the doctrine of Nicolaitan was developed. And after that age is the Teteran Church age. And you remember about the uh, harlot of Revelation 17? And there was Jezebel in the Teteran Church age. There was a local church in Teteran. Remember the menorah? How God instructed how you will like it. You will get the light from the other. The church started out from Ephesus and spread out towards Laodicea. The fire. And what about the age? The truth of God transferred from one age to the other. Let me compare that to what the uh, church of Manalo would explain it. The church was despaired and the church got restored. The same as the church of uh, Lysio Soriano. The church got disappeared and the church got restored, uh, got back. But the truth is that the church never disappeared. Right. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail upon it. The church never disappeared. Right. There was just a falling away and a restoration. And this is what you need to see. Could you open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 21? This is the church age. There's a picture of the church age here. If this is something that if God did not write, instruct John to write about the church, seven churches, just for historical reasons, in fact, God purpose to show us what is happening to the church until the future. How he will come back for his church. Are you part of the bride? Are you part of the true body? You know, there are many organizations today, and these big organizations, just giant organizations, you never notice it. There is a Nicolaitan spirit in there. The Nicolaitan spirit eventually will end up in an ecumenical spirit. The ecumenical spirit will do away with doctrines. Let's not talk about doctrines. Let's not talk about differences. Let's just love one another and care for people in the flesh. Right. Give charitable works, like what Mother Teresa does. The church, the, I'm not just talking about the Catholics, I'm talking about Protestants, I'm talking about Pentecostals. These churches are coming together for charity. They're forgetting about differences anymore. Right. You know, you, you can discuss differences, but you don't have to fight over it. We could share with love with each other. If you still don't understand certain things, you can still continue to love each other and still continue sharing with each other until you understand those things. Let's reason out as what the Bible says. But they have done away with doctrines and they have got in them the economical, economical movement, uh, economical spirit. Economical spirit is coming together in unity but laying aside doctrines, laying aside the truth of God's word. Right, right. Let's not discuss things that will divide us. But God intends for us to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. There's a difference what true believers today and a false believer would be. A false be believer could be very kind in the flesh. But they, they couldn't care less anything about much about the doctrine. And most of the time they're Nicolaitan or lukewarm. These two spirits are cousins. Nicolaitan, you're close-minded. You suppress the people. Look one. You, you don't necessarily suppress the people. But you don't have any interest in it. And look what, what's happening to the churches. They're, they're attending churches. They're zealous for God. But not in truth. Romans 10.1 Not according to truth. They're zealous for God. For church activities. You know, I'm not, I have nothing against some of, some of those church activities are good, but you still need to prioritize in worshiping God by His Word. Know the truth, know the difference, know the scriptures, which is true. Trinity, oneness, which is the right baptism, Jesus' name, <coughs> in the titles of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So there are many other things, not just the Godhead and baptism. Now, let's open up uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. So 21, please read for, for us, uh, Brother Jerry. This speaks of the restoration. And if there's a restoration, we should find that restoration. What is that restoration? We have to go back to where 
we left off. In the group where we left off in the world. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. Kaya nga, mga magsisi kayo at mga barit loob upang mga pawi ang inyong mga kasalanan. Upang kung magkagayon ay magsidating ang mga panahon ng kaginawaan mula sa harapan ng Panginoon. At upang kanyang suguin ang Kristo na itinalaga sa inyo na si Jesus na siya ay kinakailangang tanggapin ng langit hanggang sa mga panahon ng pagsasauli sa datis ng lahat ng mga bagay na sinalita ng Diyos sa mga magitan ng kanyang mga banal na propeta buhat pa ng una. Repent ye therefore and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. And God shall send the uh, refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And He shall send Jesus Christ, which was once preached unto you, which heaven must receive. For is God Christ in heaven, who is mediating for us. He is our advocate. He is our high priest. He is our mediator. He is our advocate. He must, who must remain in heaven until... Take note, underline in your Bible, mark it down. The restitution of all things. The restoration of all things. And what is that all things? In verse 22 it says, What does verse 22 say? Una na sinabi ni Moises, Ang Panginoong Diyos ay magtitindig sa inyo na ang isang kupitang gaya po mula sa gitna ng inyong mga kapatid. Siya ang inyong pakinggan sa lahat ng mga bagay na sa inyo ay sasalitay niya. Hearken on to all which the prophets would reveal, and all, all things which he will say. All things refers to his word. All things means spiritual things. Of course, it includes the promises of redemption of this world, promises of the redemption of our body. All things. Christ was given as an inheritance. All things. Hebrews 1 2. What is that all things? All things of the Father given to the Son, and what the Son has, He will pour out to the bride. He will pour out to the church. What is that all things? First of all, it's the Word. You have nothing to hold on to right now, it's the Word. You claim you have the Spirit of God? What is your attitude towards the Word of God? There are many differences in doctrines today in the church. And what what are you doing? Do we ignore them? Oh, I don't want to part uh, participate in those discussions. No. Even though it confuses you sometimes, you must sit down. You didn't know if the truth is so important, it's a major doctrine, it's as clear as daylight in the scriptures. It's as clear as daylight in the scriptures. So we have to reckon ourselves. What is God doing in the last days? Why did God uh, write down for John, uh, instruct John to write down the book of Revelation. What is the purpose of the church again? It's the love letter of Jesus Christ to right. the church. And if you are the bride of Christ, you would hunger to know that letter. You would hunger to know that word. So, uh, last scripture I'd like to share before I go to another subject. The, another, the other subject I'd like to share is about... Uh, hukum ministry training about the family and uh, church. But uh, I'd like to finish this uh, uh, short uh, introduction about the message. Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 and 6. I'd like to introduce something which we might have uh, overlooked sometimes in our readings of the scripture. Malachi chapter 4 talks about Elijah. And if you start from verse 1, it talks about Moses. In verse 5 and 6, it talks about Elijah. There was Moses, there was Elijah. I'm going to show you here in the tribulation period, the coming of Moses and Elijah, not as the original individual in the past, but the spirit and power of <coughs> Moses and Elijah. The spirit and power of Moses and Elijah will come back for your earth. And this is your sign of the end time. This is the sign the rapture should have taken place. And if you're still left behind, what you have to contend with is their message. Because if you read Revelation chapter 11, their message is going to impact the world. And this is what I said, Pastor Jerry, what I would like to share about the mark of the beast in the last day. <laughs> Let's talk about Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 and 6. Let me summarize this. Let's read, uh, if you have your Bibles, open up Malachi chapter 4. Verses 5 and 6. 
Five talks about if you have English. No, no, no. Tagalog. Let me quote the English. Behold, I will send you Elijah before the great and coming of the dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children back to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The curse that will be smitten of the world is Armageddon, the end of the world. When all these governments have been burned up and it will be replaced by the government of Jesus Christ. Do you believe Jesus Christ will literally come back here on earth again? In the millennium? Do you believe that? Amen. If you believe that, then we have something to hope for. Do not be contented in this life. Do not be deceived in this life as though everything is going good. No, it's a deception for the Antichrist. But the all these things that you see, not one stone will be left upon another. That's what, will, what happened to the temple. The same thing is going to happen in this world. Now, in Malachi 4, it talks about like that. See, starting from verse 1. The wicked people, they will not be left near even a stump or the root. They will be burnt up. Then, remember the Lord Moses. And why was the Lord Moses coming to remembrance? Because the Lord Moses brings us back to Israel. Did you know that the gospel will go back to Israel? Sometime later, Romans chapter 11 verse 25, blindness in part is subject to Israel until the fullness of Israel of the Gentiles will come in. Verse 26, so all Israel shall be saved. The blindness, the blindness of Israel is temporary. In, in the time when they said blindness of Israel, they were the ones that crucified Christ on the cross. They rejected the promise given by God to them, so it was poured out to the Gentiles. Now that we have for 2,000 years the gospel, the gospel will eventually go back to the Gentiles, to the Israel. And that's why there's a prophecy here in Malachi chapter 4. The prophecy here is the spirit of Moses and Elijah as they reintroduce Jesus Christ back to the Jews. Right. Yeah. Now, he turned the hearts of the fathers to the children. That was in the time of John the Baptist. Could you open up Luke chapter 1, verse 17? I'm going to show you what form of Elijah that came back. The form of Elijah that came back was not Elijah himself. You remember, uh, Peter was asked by Christ, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah. They're thinking of reincarnation. They're thinking of uh, resurrection. No. It was the Spirit. Christ said, truly, Elijah has already come, and they knew him not. This Elijah, in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, what did it say? Underline it. The Spirit and power of Elijah. The Spirit and power of Elijah is the Spirit that will... Come back to this one of these two prophets in the last days. And at the same time, there's the spirit of Moses. And you can see that in Revelation chapter 11, how he, they would turn water into blood. And it would not rain for three years. It will throw the whole world into chaos. And the whole world will hate them. And Barjeri, the mark of the beast is terrorism. They don't believe they're from God. They think these two prophets are one of those doomsday cults like terrorists. Are you aware that several cults have already risen that claims for the end of the world? There was one in Japan. There was even those in Y2K in Israel. There were a group that went there and they were just stopped by police. They wanted to cause trouble like what Judas plans to do so that the end of the world will come. But they were stopped by police. How about, how about the Muslims? Did you know the message of uh, ex-president Ahmadinejad? He said, the Mahdi would come, but there must come a conflagration first. There must come a world conflict first. So the whole world vying for peace. They want peace. Don't you want peace? We're peace lovers. But the whole world's peace is not the way God's peace gives. Peace I give unto you, but not as the world gives. The peace of the world is a deception. When they shall say peace, 
and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. The peace of the world is deceptive. The peace of the world is a compromise to the morals and truths of God. Let the gay people get married. We want peace. But they're letting the devil in. The kind of peace is deceptive peace. Now, what was mentioned a while ago, Chris Lam, that they're, they're, they're just one of the many compromises that has compromises that, compromises that has already taken place. What kind of peace are you vying for? When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. The whole world wants peace, but these two prophets are destroying the peace. So they are terrorists. You know, you will be apprehended if you're left behind. Because you would, you would pledge your allegiance to the message of the two prophets because you were left behind. We're talking about the Holy Church. If you were left behind, why would they apprehend you? Because you did not believe in the Trinity? This is what I've been hearing from the message. But I'd like to share my point of view here. Will they apprehend you just because you baptized in Jesus' name? Will they apprehend you just because you just believe in the Trinity? Gone are the days of the Dark Ages where they force their doctrine down to your mouth. No. Today's age is a deceptive age. Believe what you believe. The Laodicean church age is people's right, people's reasoning. You believe what you believe, just keep the peace. But these two prophets have a message from God. God is bringing down judgment on this world. And they wouldn't believe it. And they think they're, these two are just terrorists. And when they, these two got killed, they, they had believers. These believers will be seen as accomplices in their terrorist acts. Supposed terrorist acts. And that's why they will be apprehended. apprehended. Not for the doctrines of whatever doctrines they have. It's about the belief of the message, the judgment. You want to read their message? Let's read their message. Revelation chapter 14. Let's open it up. The three angels' messages. Let's open it up. Revelation chapter 14. I did memorize the verse. Please look it up for me. There are the three angels. Maybe from verse 1 to verse 5, there was the uh, 144,000. These will be the ones that carry the message to the whole world. Now, then there will be the first angel's message, the second angel's message, third. Mark it down, write it down. What verse is the first angel's message? What verse is that? 14. 14? Verse 6. That's the first angel's message. Mark it down. What, what was the first angel's message? Fear God. Well, that's very basic. Because most people don't fear God anymore because they're not believers of God. So what's the second angel's message? Babylon is fallen. And what is that Babylon that will fall? Is it Iraq? Is it the Vatican? Is it the Twin Towers? Or the whole world? If you preach a message that it will be the end, it will be like, it will be like in the time of Jeremiah. When Jeremiah was a prophet to King Zedekiah, saying, Surrender to the Babylonians. You're defeated. Bring him to the dungeon. You're discouraging the troops. We're fighting against the Babylonians because we're supposed to be of God. No, you're, you've rebelled against God. That's why you have to surrender to the Babylonians. It's the will of God for you to surrender to the Babylonians. There was a false prophet. His name was Hanania. Was it correct? Hanania? He said, oh, the bondage will be broken. No, God will replace it with a bondage of metal. He cannot make it out. The man, the, uh, Jeremiah was considered a false prophet. And they placed him in the dungeon, and his message was considered to finish. The same message of the two prophets, the same message of the 144,000, that this world is about to go down. Babylon is falling. That Babylon is this whole world that will come down. And when this whole world is going to come down, what will be seen as these two prophets? They are terrorists. They are out there to destroy the peace. Let me show you the, the hatred for these terrorists, supposed terrorists. And... There's this last message. Any of you worships the beast or his image or receives his mark in his head or his forehead, the same shall receive the wrath. What is that mark? And here it comes the subject. Is it a microchip? Is it the RFID chip? 
Is it your credit card? Is it the number of the bank? Is it the Nicolaitan spirit? It's still, it's already existing today. It's a Nicolaitan spirit and the Berean spirit. Nicolaitan spirit uh, suppressing the freedom of the people to prove all things. Berean spirit, the hunger for truth. Going back to the word. The repentance of Acts 2.38. These are the two marks. You have the mark of the, the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Hallelujah. Now, here in the last days, we when this mark, what is that mark during the tribulation period? The mark today is different because we have churches, we have Christians that are looked for in Nicolata, you have the mark from the beast. But not necessarily uh, you're allied to the system. Now, when the time comes in the tribulation period, when the two prophets come in the scene, and the whole world rejects that message, and they're deceived by the Pope to say, oh, they're against the peace, then that will be your mark. That will be your mark so that you will be martyred in the name of Christ. Why? There are two scriptures that talk about the martyrdom. Just write it now. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. For the testimony, they were martyred for their... What, were, what was their message so that they were martyred? They're just saying, it's not true that these two are terrorists. They are from God. Or you're one of the cooks, you're one of the fanatics. Bring him to the dungeon. Like Jeremiah was. Now, let's go to a biblical evidence. This is a uh, advanced news in the future. Revelation chapter 11 verse 10. Let's open up. You can read the hatred of the whole world and how the whole world has been deceived into thinking these two prophets are terrorists. Revelation chapter 11 verse 10. Could you read for us? Any English Bible there? Sorry, uh, let me correct myself. Revelation chapter 11 verse 10. Please read for us. Chapter 11 verse 10. And those that will upon the earth, they continue. So, yeah, just read they would rejoice in hearing news that these two prophets were killed, were finally killed after three and a half years of torment. Because these two prophets tormented them, and they would send gifts all one with another. It's not the Christmas season yet. That's it. And they would send gifts one to another in rejoicing to see these two prophets dead. And they would not allow these two, the bodies of these two prophets, these two witnesses, to be buried. They want the whole world to see that they're dead. Just like they want Osama bin Laden to be shown. Or Nicholas Sashescu when he, he was finally overthrown. They want to show he's dead, he's dead. That's the hatred they had for the two prophets. But they had a false accusation. These two are not terrorists. But at that time, what is the mark of the beast? You were deceived by the whole world that these two are terrorists. They would rather believe in terrorists, they would rather believe in aliens than believe in God. Why did you say, fear God? Because most people today would rather believe in aliens, extraterrestrial aliens, as their God, as the panspermia of this earth, <laughs> the one that so black you heard about on this earth, rather than believe in an all-powerful, all -cre -cre one creator being that gave us our existence. That's why fear God. And, and so effect, the morals came down, there was no standards anymore of right and wrong. And you see our children today, which brings, brings me to the last topic I'd like to share. Uh, I, I don't just would like to offer this to send to you, to be sent to you. I'd also like to offer seminars, if you're open to that. Um, not just messages, doctrinal messages. I'd like to offer uh, services 
the ministry of helping out your families and your churches. Be grow in grow in the spirit in the Lord. Um, the morals of this day uh, even affect even believers today. Even believers in the churches. And uh, since my time is very short, I'm just going to give a short introduction. I'm going to introduce a ministry that's supposed to be in the church, but is normally absent in most of them. Those that have them are so inadequate, they're not enough to bring people to the knowledge of the Lord. So most churches train, disciple their members to open the Bible, to pray. That's good. But they come short of it. You know what? It's also the obligation of the church and its ministry to teach its followers, its, its disciples, how to grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. They say growing in the grace and knowledge, they will grow in maturity. Let's open up our Bible. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. This is what's happening in the churches today. They're growing stagnant because one major factor is what I've mentioned a while ago, this barren repentance. This is a master key. This is not just a uh, accidental thing that you believe only in the last day. Any age you live in, whether in the church age, in the Old Testament, whatever age, in the beginning or in the middle, in the dark ages, in the end, this master key is, is still remains the same. What saved the, the thief on the cross? He was never able to study the Bible. There was repentance in his heart. This repentance is his heart. It's what God saw and justified him. But that does not excuse some of our believers here. Oh, I'm just like the thief on the cross. I accepted. It's over. No. God knows your heart. That's why I said the rare repentance. It's not how much truth you know. It's how hungry you are for the truth of God in your day. The message in your day, how open you are, how to receive His Spirit, to see, receive His truth, to so go back to the Word. Amen. And that is what's lacking today. Okay, let's read Hebrews chapter five, verse twelve. Is that the English Bible, brother? Can, can I borrow the English Bible? I'd like the English Bible to be uh, recorded. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 gives us an example of this kind of ministry that is supposed to be present in the church, but are lacking, okay? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. Please read, Brother Jerry. For when, uh, for when, for the time ye go to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. You have need to study again the main oracles of God. Brother Lina, Brother Jerry, Brother Lita, and some others. Maybe you've gone to some churches where the members are many. Let me ask you. Are they fully aware of the doctrine they should be standing for? Are they fighting for the doctrine? Or they couldn't care less? Just like the Church of Manalo would say, their member would say, don't talk to us. We're just ordinary believers. Talk to our pastor. If you've convinced him, we're going to follow him. What a deceptive lie. Every believer, work out your own salvation. Your salvation does not lie in the hands of your preacher. He was just a guy. He was just an Eliezer that would bring Rebecca to Isaac. You don't elope with Eliezer. Rebecca don't elope with Eliezer. Your preacher, your minister, your messenger, even your star prophet messenger, they're your Eliezer. You need Jesus Christ as your Isaac. You need to go back to the Word. The role of Paul was what? Not to draw people into loyalty to him, but he was to introduce the bridegroom. He's not the bridegroom. He's not the main person to be followed to. And he's just a help, a guide.
to assist you to meet the bridegroom. And meeting the bridegroom is you becoming bereaved in the Word. That's what every minister in the fivefold ministry of Ephesians 4.11 duty is to do. That's the duty of every fivefold minister. And that's what's missing. I believe there are many gifts. But those gifts have become self-serving. Instead of training people to become Berean, those gifts have been used to build empires, to enrich themselves. They really have gifts. But what, are, what will those gifts end up with? Just because you have the gift, you earn the truth. The last day they will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many things in your name? I will say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me that ye that were iniquity. They had real gifts, but those gifts were not served for the full purpose of the Christ we used for. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. You need to learn the oracles of God again. Verse 13, could, could you read please? Verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a being. Now let's talk about milk. Now most people today have itching ears. That's what the Bible says. They don't want to hear certain things. They don't want to talk certain things that make them uncomfortable. Especially doctrinal things. Doctrinal disagreements. They would prefer to hear good things. Prosperity gospel. Healing. Social gospel. They would prefer to hear light message. But what Paul was rebuking them, you're still drinking milk. You become unskillful in the word. By the time you ought to be teachers, you still need the milk again. Right. You never grew. You become stagnated. What did you call in Tagalog? Bansot. And there comes this deterioration, this backsliding. Even if you're active in your church, but you're dying inside. Because you don't have the bridegroom. You don't have the word. You don't have the seed. It has become a dead ritual every Sunday service. It's no longer part of your life. Your worshiping of God is only one day a week. But it's supposed to be every day of your life. Amen. Amen. And how do you worship God? There's that word. And why did God, God allow all those denominations to run? run by, it's for the purpose of the bride. To prove all things. God has allowed them to freeze in time what they believed in, what they've come short in their revelation. From Luther, from Wesley, to Calvin, to Knox. Even to the prophet. And they're out there for you to prove all things. But what have you been doing? Like what the Bereans did. They offered up the scriptures day and night. Verse 14 to be read. This is what God's intention is for the true believer of the church. But strongly belong it to them that are full of age. Even those who by reason of use of their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. Strong me. Talk about the big things of God. Senses exercise to discern good and evil. And this is the, the full ministry I'm talking about. I'm just going to give a short introduction. There is a church ministry which I would like to spark up in your church, if their time would allow, if you would give chance for this seminar, that people should be taught what is right and wrong. And there are many factors on that. First of all, as an individual, do you understand that it's repentance of Acts 2.38? Do you understand that repentance there entails being barren? Do you know that entails being barren is how to take note of others? Before you judge others as wrong, exhaust their evidence. That also includes your attitude, your perseverance, your patience, your long-suffering. Some people are very knowledgeable in some biblical truths, but they have a short temper. They don't have any patience. Even in personal matters. They might be good in the Bible, but they're not good in the attitude in their relationships. That's, in, that's the part of this very training. 
let's go to the relationships. How many of you have encountered problems with your relationships? With your spouses? Did you raise your hand? Just be honest. I'm not going to ask them for the details. How many of you have encountered problems? None? Or have you? Now, of course, whether you admit it or not, everyone has that problem. You don't even think that's normal. But I'd like to show you something in the scriptures. Let's just make you just a, a, a flurry of scriptures, just take them down, because we're going to read all of them. First Corinthians chapter 7 talks about relationships, but we're not going to, that's not on, the only scripture regarding relationships. Now, do we have a doctrine? Do we have a message? How, what would govern the relationship of a husband and wife? <coughs> is there any doctrine that governs? Or what you only know is marriage and divorce? There are. Amen. I'll give you an example. First Corinthians chapter 7 verse 5. Please read for us, Brother Jerry. This is a fellowship between the husband and the wife, which they should be having every day of their lives. First Corinthians 7 verse 5. This talks about um, their incontinence, uh, if you understand the word. They quote you not one of the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give you yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tell you not for your incontinence. That's one aspect that governs the relationship between husband and wife, but it goes deeper than that. How about your children? Did you know? Let me give you some ideas. Did you know that you were mandated by God to train your children? And how are you training your children? Just bringing them to church? Let me show you one way of training your children. You talk of the doctrine. You talk of God's word with them. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7. Please open up. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7. And you'll be surprised how much volume you have to talk to your children with. And that, that, it does not end there. Just that does not end there. It's more than that. Let us read first. Deuteronomy 6 verse 7. Hey, Marjorie. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them. Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou lies down, and when thou risest down. Have you noticed that there's almost no free time for the child? Listen to me, listen to me. It's very wrong to allow your children to be friends with the world. Even bring your children to school where there are lots of worldly influences. That's why the Christians in the United States started out this homeschooling. You were instructed by God to pray your children and not allow them to fellowship with darkness. That's why your children are corrupted. They will be corrupted in school. They will be corrupted in their free time. They will be corrupted what kind of friends they have. But you are the first friends of your children. You're supposed to talk to them. If you're a Bahrain, you love the Word of God. You love the deep things of God. You talk with your spouse. You talk with your children. Whatever. Even if they're washing dishes. You go to the market to buy. You talk of them. Does not end there. Does not end there. I'm just giving you a bird's eye view. Isaiah 59 verse 21. You require them, you require them to speak the same things you spoke of them. You can let them hear message tapes, you can let them read message books. If you instruct them to open up the scriptures, read how the tracks, then Isaiah 15, uh, 59 verse 21 should be opened up. You must demand them, require it of them. To speak it out. That is how you train your children in the Lord. Isaiah. It's just Isaiah 59. 10. These are some of the basic tenets, basic principles that uh, that will be in this seminar, in this uh,
hukum membahaskan ini. Okay. Please follow along how I read this. Isaiah 59:21. As for me, this is my covenant with them. This is the instruction of the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and the words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord. From your own mouth, you should speak the word. From the mouth of your children, they should speak the word. From the mouth of their children's children, they should speak the word. It is a legacy. It is a tradition. Every day, we need to have each family that is of the Lord to have this fellowship, this cell group, where in they, every day, are required to report from the messages. And that is how you bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that is what's lacking in the churches. And that is why it's now inadequate to prevent them from being influenced. Those who are prevented from being influenced are sometimes influenced to become barren on the other on the other side. That's also not good. We want to bring them in the nurture of admonition of the Lord. We bring them up also with the same spirit of being barren. And they're, they're still children. They still don't understand many things. But if you, if you train them after several years, then they will not depart from it. Then after you're gone, after your interest from me is gone. He's graduated from home school. He might have work, but he has many friends, Christian friends. Then his his being well being is protected. His life being is protected. His relationship is protected. That's for the family. And lastly, let me give the fourth category in this planning about the church. I call this the progressive ministry. Every ministry has a judge, and most of this judge, uh, judgment counseling is defensive, shall we say. If there is a problem, they settle it. It's in the Bible. Let's open it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 6, 1 and 2. Could you read for us? May any of you hugging a market against what other go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So, if, the, uh, if saints are to judge the small matters, then there are things which the saints must know. That scripture shows there is an existence of a judge counseling ministry, hukum ministry in the church. For those who had problems to settle, but more than that, when you talk about small matters, it also speaks about spiritual growth. Which television show should you watch? How should the church fellowship? Do they just listen from the pulpit? How should one admonish one another? How should the church grow? What is their attitude? Is everyone a royal Christian or just a pastor? Is it everyone or just a pastor? Come on, give us an answer. Just uh, any answer. Is it just the pastor, the minister, or everyone? All states.